Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. We've had some technical difficulty today. A lot of technical difficulty today. <laughs> so, I was just coming on, so. Um, A lot of technical difficulty today. So hopefully we can get this going if you're joining me. <laughs> Sorry for being on, coming on late. I was trying, nothing wanted to let me come on live. I was, I was doing, um, trying to come off of my computer because I was going to try to record it on something different and it just did not want to work for me today. So I don't know what's up with that. It's, it's Facebook, it's electronics and electronics do stuff like that. So, um, just so you'll know, let's like and share for uh, other people to see and hear and uh, go ahead and uh, if you want to plant a seed, it's all up there in the title of this message. And um, we're gonna get started in about uh, a minute. I'm giving a few more people to get on. Um, I know that uh, Sundays uh, today, I don't know, something I just couldn't get moving today something about Sundays, but uh, things have been going, how summer's been going okay with everybody, hello out there, and uh, summer's in full swing, especially here in Louisiana, it is really, really hot, it got, fa it got hot fast, you know, there's some summers, you know, we kind of gradually get into the, the heat, and then there's some summers, it's like, bam, we're going to hit you all at once with all the humidity and everything else. So that's what happened. So today, uh, I think it's going to be another record heat. I don't know if we're going to have any uh, rain, but we'll see. So let's get started into the the word this morning. First, I want to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Father God, I thank you for each and every person. I thank you, Father God, that you sit on the throne and that you reign over everything, Father God. That, Lord, that you cause things to happen even when we don't see that they're happening. Father God, that you cause us to prosper. You cause us to walk in healing. You cause us to be uh, to flourish when it seems like we're not even flourishing. Father God, that you are making things happen for us to flourish in the background. And Father God, I thank you for this, Lord. I thank you for you being a deliverer, for you setting us free, for you giving us words to set us free, Father God. Lord, I thank you for your word that comes with power like a rock and like a hammer, that Father God, that it divide, that hammer divides up the pieces of the word and it becomes fire within us, Father God. Lord, I thank you for this and I give you praise in the name of Jesus, amen. So we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about a very uh, uh, uplifting subject. It's called pits. Yes, I know. How can pits be an uplifting subject? I mean, you get thrown into a pit. You may be staying in a pit. You may feel like you're living there now. You may seem like there's no way out. But there is. God has a plan and he has a, a, a will and what he is doing and how he is doing it. And so we're going to talk about being in the pit and being delivered. Now, my, my keynote scripture for this is in Zechariah. I'll give you a few minutes to turn there. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. And then we're going to jump off from there. You know, I, I, I've been holding this and I wouldn't tell Apostle Jason what I had because he would try to preach it. Just just a word of knowledge. If you're a preacher, don't tell him what you got because he'll preach it. 
He'll take it and run with it. So, in verse 10, it says, I mean, in verse 11, it says, As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, O prisoners, who have the hope this very day, I'm declaring that I will restore double to you. So, number one, we have God's promises because of his blood covenant. We know that because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are continuously under this blood covenant. The same as Israel, they made a blood covenant with animals, but now he makes a blood covenant with his son and us, and we are bound, are under that blood covenant. And so that's what sets us free from a waterless pit. Now, a pit is something that is deep. It usually has no life in it. It may have been a former uh, well where they drew water out of, and now it's just miry clay and mud, and there's nothing there. There's no food. There's no water. There's no substance in this, this pit, and that you can't sustain. So you could go three days without water, seven days without food. So eventually, you would die in this pit. So... God saying, I'm delivering you out of this waterless, waterless pit. Now, the waterless pit can represent there's no spirit. There's no word being um, published. There's no revelation. There's no nothing for you to gather and for you to come and be a part of. There seems like there's no hope for you to live. And so... God's saying, I, I, I'm going to deliver you from this and I'm going to cause you to have my spirit and you're going to be restored double for your trouble. So, you know, it says in, uh, in uh, Isaiah 42, 22, it says, but this is the people plundered and despoiled. All of them are trapped in caves and are hidden away in prisons, and they have become prey with none to deliver them, and the spoil with, with none to say, give them back. So God looks at you and says, look, there, there's no one that's contending for your soul. There's no one contending for your situation. There's no one that's standing in the gap that's taking care of you. And so God says, I am going to take care of you. It says in Psalms 40, to 40 verse 2, it says, he brought me out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. And we'll see that in pits, there's miry clay, there's mud. You just sink down and you there, there, there's no hope. You're just sinking. There's no hope of any water. There's no hope of anything. And so he says, I, he brought him up out of the pit. He placed him on a firm foundation. Firm foundation is his word, is on the rock. It's on what God has already proven to you, what he's going and what's already, that's already an absolute. You know, there's some things that are just absolute. It's absolute that there is, the absolute is that there is gravity on the earth. If you go up high and you fall, gravity is going to bring you down to the ground. And so there are certain things that are just absolutes in the kingdom. And the kingdom is an absolute faith, if you believe, absolute faith that God loves you, an absolute faith that Christ died on the cross and you can receive him, an absolute faith that in him there is divine healing. There's absolutes that happen that you need to believe and catch a hold on. And absolutes are, are proven that they are not going to disappear from you. It's a proven fact. It's a proven fact. If your heart stops beating, guess what? You're dead. That's an absolute. That's part of it. If your brain dies, you're dead. So that are that's things that only can be reversed by the power and the resurrection of God. And so that becomes a, a standard that happens. So 
Let's go. I see. Let's you, do one more. Oh, you have brought me, brought up my soul from Shoal, and you have kept me alive that I will not go down to the pit. So some of us like the pit because nobody can see us, and we can have a pity party, and we could be depressed, and we could be in the dark, and 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 we could cry, and and everything and then what happens is is that when the pit gets so where we are there's no food are we not getting any uh substance for us to live on then we kind of think you know maybe we need to get out of this pit but thank god god takes us out of the pit it says in uh luke 16:24 and he cried out and said father abraham this is talking about um, a, uh, Lazarus, who was the poor, poor man. And um, he, uh, the, the rich man asked for Abraham to go, asked Abraham to let Lazarus come and dip water on his tongue to cool it. And it, in response, it was, you had all the luxuries in life and he had none. Now you received your reward. It, it pays to be kind. It pays to show forth kindness. Now let's go to some place that has, that talks about pits. We're going to go to my first one is in Genesis chapter 37. Don't you love Genesis? Genesis has everything in it. Now I'm going to paraphrase this chapter, but I want you to read this chapter. Here it is that Dave, that um, Joseph had a dream. In the dream, the first dream, he told his brothers that he had sheaves and they had sheaves and their sheaves came and bowed to his sheaves. And then he had a dream that the moon stars came and bowed to him. And his dad rebuked them for that one. But he had a dream and he said it all this way, all the all kind of ways. And it made the, his brothers hate him. And because he was already loved, he was already the one that was the favored one of, jo of Jacob. And so he was, they were upset with him because of that. And then he had these dreams that he was going to rule over him. And, you know, back then people took dreams seriously. People just didn't have frivolous dreams or like what we would say it was a pizza dream or or it was a dream because we ate too much. These were dreams that were um that were taken and people believed them because they were real and they would normally come to pass. And so we know that Jacob made him a tunic of many colors. And so he sent him to go look for his brothers in Shechem. And in Shechem, Shechem actually means back or shoulder. So he was sent back to go look for them because they were off in another place. But they wound up being in a place called D-O-T-H-A-N, Donis. And it means the place of two wells. So it was a place of nourishment. It was a place of well-watered. It was a place of well, you could say a revelation. It was a, a well place that they had. So he finds them there. And before he even gets to him, his brothers see him and they said, we're going to kill him. And Reuben being the oldest goes, no, 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 no. Let's not kill him. Let's just put him in this abandoned pit over here or what was abandoned well and put them in there and let's see. Now the pit had no water, it had no substance. And so they put them down in the pit, they stripped them of all his, uh, his identifiable clothes that he was from a rich family and that he was a well-loved son and was like one of the rulers in that family. They stripped them of his identity. See, that's the first thing that happens. The enemy comes along and wants to strip you of your identity of who you are, who you are in Christ, who he has created you to be, who he has called you to be, 
who he has wanted you to be. He strips you of everything. He like takes the dream that you have and literally tears it to shred and it's no longer there. And you say, well, why does God allow this? Well, he allows this because he wants his character to be built in you so that when that word decides to come to pass in your life, you're not going to take it and frivolously throw it away or frivolously do things to it that is not what God wants you to do. He wants you to think long and hard when he gives you an assignment and how you're going to take care of it. And he wants you to operate in his wisdom, not in your own wisdom. Just think about it. If Joseph would have been made second in command of Egypt when he first got there, then what would have happened? He probably would have been a cool leader. He probably would not have forgiven his brothers and he probably then he wouldn't have saved Israel because he was a cocky 17 year old that thought he knew the whole the knew everything and God had to show him look I, I showed you this but you're going to have to go through a process that's going to happen that I'm going to bring you through so that when is all said and done, when I place this glory upon you and this, these things happen, then you're going to be a person that's going to forgive. You're going to be a person that's going to act out of kindness. You're going to be a person that's going to bring shelter to them instead of kill them. Because I imagine if Joseph was put in charge and they came and he was put in charge way ahead of time, when his brother showed up, he would have killed them because he went through a lot. But if he wouldn't have went through all that, then he would have just killed him because of spite. See, there's things that we go through that God allows to happen so that in the process, he can change our character and change you so that you can handle that weight of glory. Well, how are you getting this? How, how, how do you get that out of that? Well, if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, verse 17, for monetary, a light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond our comparison. Far beyond. Nothing we've ever seen. It's producing a heavier weight of glory. Some of us, we need to lose some of our religious attitudes. Some of us, we need to lose our attitude about judging other people. Some of us, we need to be more kind and patient. Some of us need to just let the work of God take place. Some of us need to not let people walk over us. Some of us need to come up and be that person. So here it is. Joseph is put down in the, in the pit. And when they sit down to eat, they look and they see the, Israelite, the Ishmaelites coming. And they sold him, sold him before Reuben could get back. Now, get this. If you look at it, it was Judah that sold him. So his praise sold him into captivity. Now you say, now, now, possible. Praise is what delivers me. Mm, yeah, it does. It delivers you to have freedom to accept where you are at that point and know that God is going to take care of it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to take you out of that situation. It just means that the situation is not going to control you. And you go, well, what about Jehoshaphat? Well, Jehoshaphat didn't change his situation by praise. The praise turned around and caused confusion in the enemy's camp. He never ran anybody off. It caused confusion. So your praise 
can set you free. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the situation is going to leave. It just means that the enemy is going to get confused and decide to stop engaging in the warfare that he is waging against you. That's why the Bible says to put on the spirit, the garment of praise for your heaviness. Because when you put on the garment of praise, that means the enemy gets so confused that he doesn't understand you're still in this mess. You still have this going on, but here you are, you're praising your God. And so what that does is it unlocks your mind, it unlocks your spirit, and it gives you clarity to what is happening and where to go from there. And it lights up your path. And so your praise takes you to where you need to be. In Joseph's instance, it took him to Potiphar's house in Egypt. Because where was Joseph needed in about 15 years? Egypt. So praise sold him out to Egypt, to the place where he was going to become second in command. Some of us think that our praise is going to totally deliver us and totally set us free. David praised all the time and he worshiped, but he got strategies in his worship and he taught his fingers how to war. How did he teach his fingers how to war? How did he teach himself how to get the strategies? Because he went to God and he worshiped and he praised him and God gave him a strategy to fight the enemy so that he could be set free. See, we think praise is just going to automatically set us free from our situation. And we forget that God gives us strategies and teaches us how to make war in that situation. And in that making war, see, Jehoshaphat's making war was to sing praise songs to confuse the enemy. So your war may be dancing. It may be doing shouting. It may be praising. But in that mist, you need to be quiet and hear what the strategies of God is for you to get out of the place that you're at. Depression will always stay there if you don't take steps to get out of it. And you go, but that's hard. You know it's hard. People say all kinds of things. Yes, I know it's hard. I have fought depression. But you know what? When I begin to praise, God gives me some ideas on how to get out of it and how to take care of it. And not all, all depression is um, the result of, of a spiritual attack. Did you know that some depression is a result of hormones and hormones can cause a depression? And so you may need to take a supplement. You may need to take a medication. You may need to ask God to heal you of your hormones or heal you of your thyroid issues because thyroid issues can cause hormonal imbalance, which can cause depression. See, we have to ask God about everything. You know, this week, um, this week I, I remodeled my whole kitchen, not remodeled, I organized my whole kitchen. My I have shelves and pantries and, and stuff that I, um, I had bought for my pantry because I don't have a walk-in pantry or door. And it was just all junked. You couldn't see anything or know where stuff was. And so I took and I reorganized it and I cleaned and I took things out and I decluttered. And there's one or two other things I'm going to declutter. I decluttered my refrigerator and took things and cleaned it up and, and made excuse me, made it organized. That's what you need to do in your life. There's some things in your life that is clutter and the clutter is causing you to have depression and causing you to be confused. And so when that happens, you need to declutter. You need to sit down on with a piece of paper or something and do a brain dump and dump everything on that piece of paper, what's bothering you. And when you look at it, you can see what you need to take care of. 
Because there's some things that should not be stressing you so bad that it's putting you in a pit of the of depression where you have no revelation, you have no water, you have nothing inside of you, and it's just taken and it's consuming you. And see, the thing that put him there was a word of the Lord. God gave him a word and the word put him in the pit. Oh, God doesn't do that. Yes, he does. Read Psalms 105. He says that Joseph was there until the word of the Lord came and tried him. So the word tries you. The word tries you so that you know that when you get out of that pit and when you get out of that place, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God delivered you, not yourself, not anybody else, but God delivered you. I know, I know it's hard, but that's true. It That's the way it is. And you go, well, I've never heard nobody say that about praise. Well, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah and they did nail the lion of Judah to a, to a cross and crucified him. So they crucified their praise. And it died. But in the death, there came resurrection. And the resurrection brought new power. It brought a comforter. It brought salvation. It brought healing. It brought deliverance. It brought the presence of God that we can now feel and touch tangibly when God falls upon us. But praise had to die. Praise had to be crucified. Praise had to come back to life. And so that's what happens. Your praise sometimes becomes a sacrifice and the sacrifice dies. And the sacrifice seems like it's never gonna resurrect again, but you keep on doing it and you keep on fighting because praise went down into the hell and fought the enemy and got the, the keys to death, grave, and to death, grave, and um, and and hell, and he now is the ruler of everything and squashed them. So, what are you doing? You praise one time, dance around, and wonder why God hasn't answered your prayer. You need to keep on praising. You need to keep on doing, even when things look like it's dead. Joseph thought his dream was dead. There was no life to what he saw, and we know the story. Eventually, Potter's wife sold him out, went into the jail, went into the deepest part of the jail, became over the jail, interpreted the baker's dream, interpreted the um, uh, cupbearer's dream. And then eventually, the king had a dream. Nobody could tell him his dream. Nobody could interpret his dream. And the cupbearer remembered who he was. And guess what? Potiphar was there when Joseph was brought up out of the prison. How do you think Potiphar felt? Because he put him in the prison. And so when he brought him up and he told the king his dream, Pharaoh his dream and interpreted it, then he was put second in command. So then by that time, when his brothers came, he was able to forgive them. And he was able to set him free. And he was able to offer them the land of Goshen and save them from famine. What is your dream worth and what are you willing to sacrifice to make that dream come true? Because that is what is required of you. See, to get out of the pit, you have to want to get out of the pit. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 38. We're going to start with verse one. It says, now that Shephatah, whatever that man's name, the son of Mattias and Jediah, the son of, well, it goes on, and the son of da 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 and the son of, we're going to skip that, heard the words of Jeremiah was speaking to all the people saying, 
Thus saith the Lord, he who stays in the city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans will live and have their own life as booty and stay alive. Thus saith the Lord, this city will certainly be given into the hands of the army of the king of Babylon and he will capture it. The official said, said to the king, now let this man be put to death inasmuch as he is discouraging the men of war who is left in the city and all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the well-being of this people, but rather their harm. So King Zedadiah, Zed, Zedadiah said, behold, he is in your hands for the king can do nothing against you. Then they took Jeremiah, cast him into the cistern of Mel Melajaka, the king's son, which was in the court of the guardhouse, and, let, and they let Jeremiah down with ropes. Now the cistern there was no water, but only mud, and Jer Jeremiah sank into the mud. So here it is, Jeremiah is giving the word of the Lord. He's trying to save the people in Jerusalem. Look, go on out to the Chaldeans. Go on out to Nebuchadnezzar. Go on out, go out, leave this city. Don't stay in this city. If you stay in the city, you're going to die. Well, they got upset because men of war was going out to the Chaldeans. And it's like, you're discouraging our efforts to do what we need to do to save Jerusalem. But they wasn't listening to the prophet. The prophet was telling them, there is no hope here. God has moved on. Basically, he told them a few chapters back, because of your sin, because you would not honor what the uh, law says, then I'm going to give your land over for 70 years to the Chaldeans and to the other to and eventually to the Assyrians and you are going to have to leave because of your sins and because of who you are because of what you have allowed in the land and look I'm telling you there's famine here there's things that is happening you can't stay here and the king's men got upset and threw him in a waterless pit what did Jeremiah do to deserve the pit What did he, what crime or sin did he commit to deserve the pit? None. He was given the word of the Lord, the same as Joseph. Joseph committed no sin. He did not act, he did not act out of uh, malicious. He was just telling a dream from God that would eventually come to pass. And the same with Jeremiah. He was proclaiming what was going to happen to Jerusalem. He was proclaiming what was going to be. Now, if you look on down in verse 30, 38, 7, it says that um, an Ethiopian eunuch that's part of the king, seeing that Jeremiah was in the, um, the well, in the uh, pit and he asked the king can i go and i rescue him he's going to die they're going to kill the prophet and so the king gave order and gave him 30 men to go and rescue him and he tied together rags and he tied together um uh, clothes and he tied them all together and he made a rope and he said put it under your armpits so that you can be taken out of this out of this pit now some of y'all, sometimes God throws down the rope or what looks like a rope because these were old worn clothes and rags, what looks like a rope. And he's telling you, put it under your armpits so that we can pull you out, that he can pull you out. But you refuse to even do that. Well, my God, he's going to take care of me no matter what and pull me out just because he can do it supernaturally. No, sometimes he gives you things in the natural for you to pull yourself up and, and help you get out of there. 
He sends people to pull you out, but he gives you something that you can latch on to so that he can pull you out, but you refuse to take it. And so you sit in the pit going, when is my God going to deliver you? Well, he's already sent people to deliver you. He's already sent things to deliver you and you refuse to be delivered. Because either you want to keep on holding on to your past and the hurt and everything else that's coming with it and you don't want to let it go because you like it there or you don't even see when the lifeline is thrown out to you because you're so blinded because of what right here is in your face. Because all you can see is the problem instead of looking past the problem and seeing what God is doing. Sometimes our own demise is ourselves. Our own demise of keeping ourselves in the pit is ourselves. We don't want to be delivered. We don't want to be set free. We take it and we go, well, this is what's going to happen. This is how it is. And I, I don't see a way out. And so you don't look with your faith eyes. You're not looking with your praise eyes. You're not looking with the word of God. And so you stay there. And then there's people that come and they shake you and tell you what you're doing and how you're doing it. And you still stay in that situation. God says, wake up. I've delivered you so many times from the pit and you decide to stay in the pit. Man, I wish I was in a live service. Because you decide to stay in that pit and you decide to live there. You can't live there. There's no water. There's no revelation. There's no washing of the word. There is no renewing of your mind in the pit. There's no getting out of your situation. Why? Because you want to stay there and be and, and stay down in there. And God says, wake up, get out. I'm giving you a lifeline. Time to get out. Well, the prophet wasn't stubborn. He took the lifeline. He let him pull him out. He didn't go around Jerusalem saying, look, I got out. He stayed in the guard, in the, uh, in the guard's courtyard. And that's where he lived. And then you'll read later down, the king sent for him again. And he told the king, look, if you go out, the king's not going to kill you. He's not going to burn Jerusalem. But if you stay in here, he's going to burn Jerusalem and he's going to kill you. And then he begins to tell him how he's going to be killed and what's going to happen to his wives and stuff. And the king says, don't tell nobody. And if you read, the king stayed in the city and Jerusalem was burned and he died. And his sons was taken away into captivity. And his nephews, just like Jeremiah said, that's why you got Lamentations chapter three, verse 23. He says that his mercies is renewed every morning and that there is hope because Jeremiah looked upon a city that he cried for years for people to be delivered and for people to be set free and for people to be not where they were gonna die, where they would have food. And the king or the leadership refused to acknowledge that it was true and kept the people in bound and kept them bound up so that they couldn't see what was right in front of them. And some died that didn't have to die. And the city burned when it didn't have to burn. Some of us are looking at situations here in 2021 and we are believing in all kinds of conspiracies. We're believing in all kinds of things that is being said by different prophets 
that I'm telling you that is not of God. They are not telling you the truth. There's no conspiracy. It is no, it's not the end times. The vaccination is not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is going to be in your right hand, in your forehead. And I have news for you. The vaccination is in your deltoid and whatever arm you want it to be in. So it's not the mark of the beast. They're not putting no chip inside of you, nothing to mark you with, none of that. And some of you are believing conspiracies after conspiracies after conspiracies of what's going on. And then we have those that are in leadership in the government that are sitting there and the enemy is feeding them all kind of lies. And the Bible says that we're to pray for those that are in authority over us so that we can live in peace. You can't pray you can't pray for someone if you keep thinking that they are not worthy of your prayers. Where is that in scripture? Tell me. Type it, DM me. Tell me a scripture where it says for you not to pray for those in leadership, for you not to pray for your government, for you to choose who you want to pray for in government. I want to see the scripture. Don't come with me that God told me. I want to see the scripture because God does not go contrary to his word. And don't come with one scripture that you've taken out of context. I want two to three scriptures that you have thought that you have thoroughly searched out in scripture and bring it to me then we can discuss it. There are people that are prophesying that are not even prophesying the word. And you are allowing these people to have access to your spirit and to your mind. And it is causing confusion and causing you to live in the pit. I'll be the first one to tell you. I may not know it all. I may not understand, but I do have a heart after God and he will correct me if I'm wrong. And not everyone has everything together when it comes to the word. I've been reading this word since I've been eight years old. And there's things in it that God still gives me that I'm like, wow. And he talks to me and I'm like, wow. So you're never fully understand the things of God. You won't fully understand the things of God until you get into heaven and you look upon his face and then all your answers will be answered. And then we're not supposed to believe what the world says anyway. If the Israelites kept believing what the Egyptians were telling them, now get this, the Egyptians kept them in bondage. And it was more of them than it was of the Egyptians. And when Moses started saying what he said and told Pharaoh to let his people go, and he let the people go, there was over a million people that was Jewish that was Hebrew, that walked out of Egypt. And they took them, and they took everything that Egypt had. They ransomed it. That means that they took all their gold, all their silver, everything. None of them was sick. None of them was uh, 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 crippled, none of it. And they walked out with their heads hanging down, uh, um, up high, and they were rich people. They were slaves there, but out of that pit, they became rich people and formed a nation. What is your excuse? If the people would have kept believing that Egypt had control over them, they would have never made it to Mount Sinai. If they didn't have some type of faith, 
If they didn't have faith in Moses, if they didn't have faith in God, what would have happened? Look at, look at the apostles. If they wouldn't have believed what Jesus told them, and they doubted somewhere along the way, if they wouldn't have believed, then they wouldn't have became the apostles that you know. It was by faith. It was by faith that Abraham had a son. It was by faith that Jacob sojourned into the land of Egypt. It was by faith that Moses delivered them. It was by faith that Joshua brought them into the promised land. It was by faith that David wandered in the wilderness for 15 years and he became king of Israel. It was by faith that Jesus came, gave up everything and became our sacrifice so that we could not live in the pit anymore. What is your excuse? It's time to get out of the pit. It's time to leave all these other things that are coming around and that are clouding your mind. It's time to look at the word, accept the word, and live by the word. I live by the word. I practice living by the word. I'm not saying I do everything right. I'm not saying that I... I, 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 I am a perfect person. What I am saying is I listen to the word. I listen to what God says and I do it accordingly. What are you doing? What pit are you in that you need to be delivered? It's time to be delivered. It's time to be set free. It's time to put your feet on firm foundation and not be thrown about with every wind of doctrine. It's time to leave aside that different things that a people are saying and begin to search and find out in the word what God is saying about the situation and watch what will happen. Watch how your life will become full. Watch how it will become joyful again. Watch how you'll be delivered out of the pit. Watch how he'll bring you those promises. You have to believe. You have to believe. You have to believe. I took a nap yesterday. I won't say everything that I, I seen in my dream, but I took a nap and then I walked in. And in my dream, I walked into a sanctuary. It had sofas and and different seating places, like a multi-purpose room. And then it had a place where the pulpit was and it was a glass background and uh, water behind it. And it was all decked out in water, waters of hope colors, blue and white with a little bit of pops of red. And I like when I walked in, I knew it was our place. I just took a nap. You can't give up hope. If God said it, it's going to come to pass. You have to pray it through, intercede through, and do your warfare for it to come to pass. And watch what will happen. Watch what will happen. One last example. The other week I, 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 I was talking to God and I was talking to him about health situations and how I was tired of people in the body of Christ being sick and how I was tired of, of myself having some uh, issues. And I began to uh, pray and I took communion and I, and I took the communion and I prayed and I left it at the altar for God. It wasn't just for me. It was for other people in the body of Christ and, and for my son and, and my daughter and my husband. And it was just for everybody. And so over the weekend, last weekend, I was sick all week long. And um, we went out and I said, I want to redo the kitchen pantry. And I bought baskets and I started it Monday. I kind of realized I cut a chew took a big chunk that maybe I couldn't physically do all the way, but I started it. 
And so then Tuesday, I, I ran out of baskets, so I had to go shopping. Now, I hadn't been shopping since before the pandemic. So I went and I shopped. And then Wednesday, I had two ladies come and they came and graciously helped me put the rest of my pantry and stuff in order. And then Friday, I finished my refrigerator. But I believe that was a direct result of me praying for other people and taking communion. Because the Bible says to remember what he did on the cross. And you can take communion daily and put God in remembrance of what he did on the cross concerning his body towards you for healing, concerning his blood for washing you clean. But it gave me, it changed my whole atmosphere and the way I was looking at things. It was like a light that finally clicked on and I was coming out of the pit. And so I have other plans and other things that I am doing. And finally, I can see the end of the situation. But you have to start somewhere. I could have just bought the baskets, left them on the table and go whenever I get get to it, I'll get to it. But it was something that was in me that had to be done. And so when you see that and God has that in you, that's his way of getting you out of the pit for you seeing a vision. It could be a small vision of decluttering your kitchen, or it could be a small vision of decluttering your desk and watch what God will do for you. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Father God, I thank you for each and every person that you have put under the sound of my voice and the people that will hear this video. Father God, I ask that you deliver them from the pit right now in the name of Jesus. That Father God, they will accept whatever help that you give them. That Father God, they will see that you are delivering them in the name of Jesus. And Father God, I thank you for this. Father God, I thank you for your delivering power that you're taking and you're delivering them. You're delivering their families. You're delivering their finances. You're delivering them in their health, Father God, and that you're causing them to have a vision that they're going to come out of this pit and they're going to be sustained and they're going to be fed and they're going to be breathe upon and they will have a new look on life, a new look at their dream. And I command all dreams to come back to life in the name of Jesus, all visions to come about in Jesus name. And Father God, I thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining us. If you will please like and share this video, I would appreciate it. Uh, if you want to give, we have all the stuff to give in the little uh, up above in the title. And you can give this morning. We would appreciate it. We are in a building fund to get a building where we could start having live services again. So if you would like to contribute to that, you can. Um, we thank you. God bless you. And we will see you next week. Bye-bye.